So basically every major yoga lineage was founded by abusing motherfuckers. Every single fucking one. Like sexual abuse, financial scandals, physical abuse, you know, Iyengar beating on people, Punjabi Joyce touching women up. It's not subtle. It's on video. You can see it. This is an opinion. And these are the founders of modern postural yoga. Hey, Tribe of Dream Men and Women. So today is another special podcast with a guest I was really happy to have a conversation with, and that's Mark Walsh, who we know each other actually for quite some years, uh, back from the day when I was very much into Aikido. He has a, a great background in Aikido, a martial art as well. But uh, what's special about Mark is not only that he has a lot, a lot of experience in various body practices, such as yoga and other types of movement practice, uh, meditation, martial arts. Uh, He also has his own unique approach, uh, uh, which I believe he calls embodiment, uh, which is about looking how the body, uh, how, you know, you don't intellectualize too much. You're you're looking into not intellectualizing stuff too much, uh, but you're rather, my girlfriend, (laughs) but you're rather looking at uh, using the body to really develop certain qualities in your life. But I'm not an expert of that field, so I don't want to say too much. If you're interested in that, just check you know, everything Mark does. And on top of that, the last thing I'll just say about him, he's also organizing the biggest in the world, apparently, uh, online global uh, event where he has lots and lots of various spiritual meditation, yoga teachers, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, called the embodiment conference i believe so yeah he he has a lot of experience but actually you know without saying all the achievements that he has the greatest thing about him that i find is that he does not uh, worry about saying whatever he believes is true and that's very evident in the conversation that's exactly what i needed so to be more precise, uh, we were speaking a lot about the dark side of the yoga culture, the abuse culture, and uh, the you know, vic- uh, victim culture. There's just so much out there that I personally noticed in yoga that uh, that I used to see when I used to do it. But the um, thing is, I don't feel that enough people are talking about that. and. Uh, uh, that's the reason I really wanted to bring up that subject. And sometimes people give me a hard time because they're saying, oh, Rokas, you, you, you don't appreciate or you don't recognize the good side of yoga. The thing is, no, I do appreciate there are good things in yoga, but I believe and I see that not enough people are talking about the shit that happens in yoga. I think, you know, people are either afraid to risk their uh, profession uh, as a yoga instructor because if they will talk and reveal the dark sides of yoga, uh, you know, they might lose their students. It's a financial risk or, you know, they may lose their reputation and they're just too many people are too invested to talk about the dark things. And personally, I don't mind speaking about that, but it's hard to find a person who's as outspoken as, you know, I guess uh, I'm trying to be, but Mark is another level higher <laughs> than that. Uh, he. He does not hold anything back and he has the experience, he has uh, the knowledge, the relationships, um, he has everything to be able to speak about that and have weight behind his words. So enough flattering, (laughs) I think I've said enough. Uh, Hopefully you uh, have become interested and just check out the podcast and I hope you will be able to see some of the things and hear some of the things which are there, which are important to recognize, but too often they are not spoken about, but not in this podcast. So enjoy. One thing I like to ask at the beginning is non-humble version of a quick introduction of yourself, of cool facts that people would be like, oh my God, he's so awesome. He's so awesome. I, I want to hear everything he has to say. So could you, could you lay out a few cool facts about yourself? So I run the Embodiment Conference, which brings together a thousand different teachers of body, mind, arts from around the world. And it will be the largest online event in human history. And that's happening in October. And we have 100,000 already booked, and it's going to be much bigger than that. I wrote a book called Embodiment. It sold pretty well. I have a podcast called Embodiment uh, that does pretty well. Uh, my own background is 24 years of uh, martial arts, yoga, meditation, dance, different practices that could be called that umbrella term of embodiment, body, mind, arts, and doing that around the world. Um, So yeah, is that enough bullshit about me or do you need more?
I'm sure you could go on, then, but it's already late. <laughs> Uh, it's nice to see you again, man, as well. It's nice to see you. Same here. Same here. Actually, one more thing so that people would be included. Uh, what about your – one of the subjects I want to talk about mo most in this case is yoga or uh -huh. kind of the whole subject. So what's your relationship with yoga and your, your work in terms of the body? Yeah, sure. I'm having a breakfast smoothie here, so you might see me chewing at times. Um, I, yeah. I did um, yoga since I was a kid, really. Uh, my mum did yoga. So I kind of grew up with it. And at first it was like something really uncool that like, like people left over from the sixties did. Um, and then I, you know, I was doing martial arts as a young guy, particularly a young guy involved in criminal activities and had a lot of yang, a lot of kind of fire on, you know, martial arts appealed to me more, but the, the style of yoga that I picked had a lot of stretching in it. Um, Kanetsuka sensei, who was the head of our organization was big on Makaho, which is like Japanese yoga. So it was always part of my keto practice as well. I might do 30 minutes a day, every day of stretching. Uh, as just part of the, the Aikido practice. But also I was on my own a lot when I was traveling the world and I couldn't always get to Aikido dojos and there wasn't online training or anything like that then. Um, so I would just do like a lot of moving exercises and stretches and different things, you know. Uh, and then at a later point, I started doing yoga more seriously. Um, I did a lot of yoga under what's called Scaravelli style, which is a very sort of soft fluid style of yoga, which is popular in Brighton where I live. And also found that yoga traveled pretty well. I could put it in my suitcase. So I was traveling around, teaching embodiment around the world. And yoga, A, it was easy to find. And B, if I couldn't find the studio, it was easy just to do it in a hotel room. You know, you didn't even need a mat, really. So I started doing more yoga. Um, at a certain point, I started questioning, like, what the hell am I doing this for? Like, there's all these claims within yoga. And I started thinking, I'm not sure if I believe some of these. And it just didn't seem to be very efficient at doing what it said it was doing. Um, so I basically kind of got very critical of yoga for a few years and I, you know, got thrown out of yoga forums and this is back in the day when the yoga world hadn't looked at its abuse history, which is massive, hadn't looked at its lack of consent culture, hadn't looked at its lack of trauma awareness, uh, and wasn't really looking at it itself rationally. It was in this pre-rational frame. And I came in and was like, this is bullshit. What the fuck? You know, and just spoke my mind because that's the kind of guy I am. I did a test the other day, a psychology test. And I, I'm in the bottom 1% for a trait called agreeableness, uh, which basically means that um, it's a personality trait. And you would be quite high, I would say, on this. But like the lower the, the, lower the trait, the more likely you are to say things that upset people because they're true, basically. Um, so the primary commitment is to truth rather than relationship. And... Um, yeah, and I basically was just like saying people left, right, and center. And eventually I got tired of just like bad mouthing yoga and decided to sort of reinvent almost yoga. And I came up with this embodied yoga principles work, which is very different from anything that's out now. Now everybody thinks they're different, but this is really genuinely quite different. Like we reinvented the whole way of doing it and why you do it. And the asana, I'd say only a third, not even maybe a quarter of the asana, a traditional yoga asana. And we just realized there was a better way of getting yoga off the mat and into your life that's been my obsession so i'm not an expert pretzel person i'm not super athletic i can just about do a handstand and five pull-ups you know but um you know what i'm what i know about is is yoga and psychology and yoga off the mat in a practical western way bit of a long intro but i hope that sets the scene oh it's great it's great uh there's a couple of uh, keywords that i enjoyed uh such as abuse in yoga <laughs> that's like that that's where my radar picks up because those are some of the subjects i want to bring to the table and actually before i do that your personal experience because you are you're very public and you I mean, you connect with so many people across the globe who are in in this world uh would you say it's a subject which is covered enough or is it out there the whole kind of downside to yoga or you feel like it's still kind of kept silent or, or somewhere in between? In recent years, particularly in America and then spreading to Western Europe, less so in Eastern Europe, um, there's been a definite raising of awareness around high level abuse cases. So basically mm -hmm. every major yoga lineage was founded by abusing motherfuckers. Like absolutely <laughs> true. Every single fucking one. Like, like, like sexual abuse, financial scandals, physical abuse, you know, Iyengar beating on people, Pajabi Joyce touching women up. It's not subtle. It's on video. You can see it. This is an opinion. You can look on video and steal the stuff. And these are the founders of modern postural yoga, right? Like, you know, most lineages come from, if not directly, then through, you know, Vinyasa, come out of Ashtanga, whatever. And that was a real shock. And at first there was a lot of denial. 
and people like Matthew Remsky in the States really put it forward and, you know, kind of people really sort of started questioning this. And, you know, you can understand the Indian traditions around learning generally comes from a guru tradition of somebody knows better than you about your body and about your spiritual practice. Now, we grew up in this with Aikido, right? This is the same in Japan. This is the same in almost all of the Asian traditions. And it's fucked up. It doesn't lead to good outcomes for students or for teachers even. Um, so the, the basic frame is not, I'm an educator and I work with consent. The frame is once you're in my dojo or shala or whatever, you're under, you know, I do what I want. And if you don't want to be adjusted, bad luck. I, you know, I remember there was a time in this a, a consent culture is just coming in to yoga. Like the kink scene was way ahead of the yoga scene on consent culture. If you want to see some experts in consent, go to the kink scene. Those guys really know what they're doing. But, you know, I remember I was in a studio in London, a major studio, one of the biggest studios. And I'm lying on my back. I'm in um, is it Super Bada Castle. No, I was lying on my back with my legs crossed, my knees together. And mm. the teacher came to, and I have like a little bit of a belly, and I have big thighs and at least medium sized testicles. So these things are all in a little package, you know. And the teacher comes up to me, she goes to press down on my legs. So I'm lying on my back, my legs are here, and I'm like, no thanks, I'm good, because I know that's going to compress my testicles. Right? Like, <laughs> you know, they're already pretty uncomfortable, and I'm thinking, I don't need this. You know, they're squashed between my belly and my legs. And I'm like, I don't need a teacher. And she says, I know what I'm doing. I said, stop, don't do it. And she said again, I know what I'm doing and went to touch my knees and started pressing. And I said, get the fuck off me. And I, you know, mm -hmm. my next move would have been to punch the bitch in the face. Like, excuse the harsh language, but that is abuse. If somebody's attacking me, there's no other word for it. I know this is not just uncomfortable. This could be damaging. And I'm yeah. just giving this one example. I've seen worse examples people putting people into hardcore back bends that could cause spinal injuries and all sorts of things, you know? And, you know, I went out of that class and I was shaking and I kind of, you know, had a basic trauma response and I'm, you know, I'm pretty good with that stuff. And I, you know, I went to reception. I said, look, this happened. This wasn't okay. And they were like, well, can you fill out a form? And I was just like, really? And they were making all these excuses like, well, the teacher's very experienced and they, you know, maybe spiritually that was good for you to be, you know, I'm like, fuck you. You know, like, like the, that was abuse. And it was a very minor instance and some people's is much longer. And to be honest, what, if I look at the Aikido world, it's no different. And, you know, it's not just yoga, it's all the Asian traditions. And this is being questioned, I think, now as trauma informed is coming in almost to the point that it's going too far. You know, mm. it's becoming this very sort of far left politicized. Everybody's super sensitive. Like I, you know, I had a one complaint from a yogi because there was mirrors in a room. I did a workshop and it was like, really, you're scared of your own reflection, literally maybe you need some you know therapy not some yoga so i think there is a line where we say come on you need adult robustness they call it in the literature there needs to be adult robustness and adult responsibility as well rather than you made me feel this you made this so it can become a victim narrative and there can be attempts to claim power for victimhood as well as abuse um you know it's just a different power game so that's what i see and when it comes to knowledge you've essentially got three mindsets at work which are modern pre-modern pre and post-modern and they're all colliding in the weirdest way in yoga you know pre-modern is this is the way it always is this is the tradition that's five thousand years old no it's fucking not okay anyway but that doesn't say we've always done it this way this is the tradition that's one sort of epistemological route right truth because the quran says so truth because ayenga said so second one is the modernist tradition which we're raised in which is the foundation of our society which is Okay, you want to convince me of a, convict me of a crime? What's the proof? You want to give me a medicine? What's the evidence? Right, this is our scientific basis of a whole rational society. The Renaissance started that. They call it orange meme in spiral dynamics, if you know that system. But the Renaissance literally just hit yoga. So, for example, my friend Ariana Rabinovich did a book on yoga myths, saying you know, do twists detoxify the spine? You know, like looking at these bullshit that's told in yoga. And, you know, she just goes through it one by one and takes them apart scientifically. And it's like, why has that book just been written? You know, like, why has science just met yoga in any serious way? Like, this is since the Renaissance we've had science. And the, I hear about yogic science from India, and I'm, you know, very suspicious. It doesn't look like science to me at all. And now you've got this postmodern tradition, which is, well, everybody's right, and it's just a matter of opinion, and everybody's terribly sensitive and offended. And, like, these three, it's like, postmodern hippies doing fascist practice in a consumer culture modernist way it's like a perfect storm of three types of bullshit 
you know, because the bullshit of the modernist world is the consumerism, the body beautiful, the body as object, right? So I say, listen, when I come to yoga students, there's three kinds of wankers. There's the fascist wankers. I know I sound like one, but I'm not. There's the body beautiful wankers who are like, hey, I want to look, this body as consumer object of desire. And usually that's under a very thin spiritual veneer or even a feminist veneer. Uh, and then we've got the postmodern wankers. So you've got three ways, to, three just horrible cultural trends that are combining in yoga. And then you've just got a lot of ordinary yogis who are decent people who are just, don't, they're not big on Instagram and they're not big on the mythology and the mythology, but they're, they're just normal people who are trying to get by, but this is the world that they're in. And so you'll hear, even within yoga, you hear a lot of um, complaint about the yoga world. It seems like you, you know, had some uh, already emotions about the whole thing, but, but in terms of your personal frustration what would you say frustrates you the most about the yoga world and the hypocrisy or whatever it is well i think those three groups those three mindsets all frustrate me equally in different ways so the most primitive is just like look, it's stop pushing your weird religion on me with your weird authority structure that always leads to abuse always leads to abuse that's the frustration second frustration is you're whoring your ass in a bikini on Instagram and using that to gather validation and money while pretending that spiritual, I'm sorry, darling, but stop, stop kidding yourself and me. And people are kidding themselves. It's really hard to, and the third frustration is this kind of postmodern far left, this kind of um, uh, view of, you know, radical Marxist yoga, like communism worked out really well and just being hypercritical of anyone who's a white male, being hypercritical of anyone any kind of authority right like there's authority in terms of like knowledge base like you know more lithuanian than i do that's mm -hmm. just how it is like you're higher up a competence hierarchy than i am you can't get rid of competence hierarchies but that doesn't mean you're a better human being than me right yeah. like you have so i need to acknowledge competence hierarchies while we're not confusing them with moral hierarchies and that's the mistake the postmodernists make they say it's all equal it's all good and it's just a sea of wank at that point. Mm. Well, the power no. games around victimhood. Sorry, sorry. Uh, can you repeat that last part? The power games around victimhood. So it's a mm. form of power taking to be a victim in that world. And there's a competition mm. for who's the biggest victim. It's the woke culture, which is, you know, all of them have good intentions. So, you know, I'm slightly grumpy maybe today, but the good intention of the tradition is like, hey, we have lineage, we have tradition, good things get preserved, that can be a good thing. Structure, you know, hierarchy can be useful. The good thing of the modernist world is, well, let's test it, let's see, and you know what? It's fine if people just want to do this for fitness, there's nothing wrong with fitness, you want to get a fit body, great, good for you. And, and the good intention of the postmodern world is like, hey, there is actually real discrimination and sexism and racism, and let's, let's look at that and let's see what's going on there. You know, and, and let's let's check that that isn't happening. And, and how can we support people who are genuinely victims of abuse? You know, so that they're almost just taken too far. And the Internet has a way of magnifying that because most yogis, when you meet them, they're all right. You know what I mean? They're nice people. And, you know, they just want to chill out and they just want to do a bit of yoga. And there can be these weird spiritual fantasies that come with it, which I think are, you know, like we've seen in the martial arts in our martial arts journey. Right. Like mm -hmm. viewers might not know I went for a similar but not as public or as an extreme journey as Rockass with aikido disillusionment and realizing that it wasn't you know all it claimed to be uh, and we've seen that aikido is full of good people but then the group thing comes in and the sort of hypnosis type stuff comes in and you don't want to question the authority of a teacher because he's a nice guy and he's been helping you out for years and do you know what i mean it's, it's, it's not that there's not necessarily bad people so yeah. i mean you've studied this in publicly in a lot of depth and i think it's the absolute parallel with aikido for yoga yeah. Where would you say you're seeing like, uh, yoga uh, heading on to? Like, what would you say is the best outcome that yoga should evolve into? Like, what would you get rid of and what would you kind of emphasize in order to have yoga a decent, good, balanced practice? Yeah, I mean, I can't predict the future. So everything I'm going to say is just looking at trends. I mean, we're seeing hyper niching now because internet taught yoga. That's just a marketing factor. So it's like, for example, I saw a children's Dutch speaking yoga class the other day. Great, 100 mm -hmm. kids, 
all sounding like they've got a throat infection, speaking Dutch and doing yoga, it's great. Now my friend, my friend's student was running it. Um, so hyper niching, we'll see. So it will be like yoga for Latina single mothers who like chess, you know, like really, like we're seeing the metal yoga and the rock and the geek yoga and this kind of stuff. So we'll see hyper niching. Um, I think people will increasingly go, what do you mean by yoga? It's yoga, right? Mm -hmm. So is it fitness, which is fine? Is it a sort of Buddhist ancient, you know, lineage of, of mindfulness practice to get enlightened, which is okay, you know, or is it, you know, I have a very particular niche. I'm looking for life skills, insight, psychological insight and life skills for off the mat. That's what I teach. And being really clear, that's what I teach. I say, listen, when I want to do fitness, I go to the gym, I lift weights, I jump up and down on boxes, I do pull-ups, great. When I'm doing yoga, I'm not doing that. Because you maximize, you optimize your training for a goal. Yeah? So being really clear on the goal and the niche, we could say business-wise, but also in terms of goal orientation, I think that will increasingly become apparent. And as I say, I do see a positive trend of consent awareness, trauma culture. You know, it's being a bit overshot, particularly in North America. But it is a positive trend and i do see that you know i don't there's there's one person talks about post-lineage yoga i mean i don't think we're quite there yet but there is definitely um a suspicion of the gurus with the funny names who are you know dressing make you dressing all in white and this kind of thing that 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 has been really strongly challenged and i, I think we're not quite done with that yet but it's a good thing it's kind of something i wanted to actually ask but you also brought it up yourself uh i was curious so there's kind of those two extremes, I, I guess I'd say. Like there's yoga, which is only athletic. And it, it's kind of the downside, which I see as well. It's like, as you said, go to a fitness gym and do fitness if you want. The, it's bad the fitness. fitness. It's not even a good way to get fit. Right, exactly. exactly. Uh, then on the other side, on the other edge, you have that whole spirituality and mysticism and enlightenment, whatever people take that to be. Uh, I was curious, so so where do you take your yoga? and, and what, how much of the psychological aspect of personal development aspect do you blend with it? Can I answer this question using the spiritual yoga voice? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> like fake voice. It's fake. It's a fake veneer, whether it's voices or names or clothing. It's all fake. Um, yeah. So I, what I realized was there wasn't much of a Western but deep approach to yoga. So there was a rest and fitness and there was Eastern Medivh. So I said, okay, what does that look like? So we use um, a model that's almost archetypal. So let, let's take a pose, you know, warrior two, warrior pose, right? Uh, we have a whole lot of other poses that aren't familiar, but it'd be easier if I use a familiar one. So we use that as an inquiry as to how warrior-like you are. And there's a coaching process as to where you need that in your life. We then move it into sitting, standing, walking, and talking. Okay, so I'll break that down. So the first thing you do in the warrior pose is like, is this familiar? First time I did warrior pose, I was like, hell yeah, this is my bag, right? Because it has a quality to it that's emotional. So in traditional yoga language, you can talk about the koshas. We're working with the emotional, psychological kosher, yeah? So rather than the transcendent or just the physical. So in terms of like layers of being in a tantric model. Um, there is a precedent for it in traditional yoga. It's just not normally done that much. We also use it as inquiry. So while people are in the warrior two, we'll say, where do you need this in your life? Yeah, and people will come up with all sorts of insights and cool stuff. They'll be like, oh my God, I'm too much like this. Or, oh my God, I underuse this and I'm too nice to my kids and we'll link to life. We give them a chance to verbally debrief it with each other briefly, brief is important. That lets them name it and articulate it into the verbal and into the social domain, which is normally missing from Eastern practices. They're normally, uh, body and spirit but not really social or emotional yeah the, the asian cultures don't do that so much um then we move it practically into say a micro pose so for example how do you sit like right now or i guess if you were to sit more warrior like what would that be like so your eyes are great you're like really focused on your eyes but you mm -hmm. might like sit forward slightly yeah right? i would i would definitely change my posture i mean kind of tighten up my my spine yeah, and that's it the spine goes up you can extend through the hands you could angle slightly so mm. once you know the pose, you can take it into sitting, interviewing on a day, on a business meeting, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and you could also, we could also give you a way to walk that way. Mm. Right. There's a war, there's that New York Monday morning walk as opposed to Hawaii Sunday afternoon walk. And we can, mm. we can take it into the verbal. So how would you tell me something in that way? So we take mm. that quality that if you were energy, though I don't like the word and move it into the actual domains of life rather than, mm 
keep it simply as a stretch, which is fine. You can use it as a stretch, but we're using it in a very different way. So we're totally uninterested in fitness in the class. Um, and we're not, it's all about bringing life in, not trying to, so there's the yoga holiday model, which is you get away from life and you have this holiday in this nice world and it feels really nice. And it could literally be a holiday or an hour long holiday in your class. We're, we're not trying to relax people. We, we upset people. Most people cry in our classes, at least at some point. So like with the body yoga, which is spread all over the world, it's, it's disruptive. It's not there to make you feel nice. It's there to show you yourself and teach you life skills. That's a very different thing in its aim and its intention. So that's not for everyone. And you know, what we find is like 10% of yogis love it and they go, wow, this is really good. 90% are like, yeah, I'd rather get high. I'd rather, you know, get a buzz by doing a stanger or whatever. And that's fine, you know, different things. Does that give you a sense of it? Yeah, and I really like that direction. Just uh, some questions that come up. I'm curious about uh, what you describe sounds uh, kind of, a, like a great way for a train the trainer or private coaching sessions or like a workshop uh, does that model also apply to like regular weekly classes yeah you would probably do what we call eyp light and you know listeners can look up videos there's lots of free videos to see it and we also have all sorts of novel poses like no pose that for practicing boundaries that you just won't see in normal yoga um, not uncoincidentally i would say that one um yeah so we eyp light would be you just sprinkle a bit in so you're doing your class, you're doing your warrior pose, and you just say, hey, does this seem familiar to anyone? Okay. Anyone need a bit more of this in their life? Huh? The hands go up. You know, we do a, a regular yoga class. My friend Vidi Dasa does one, and it's like, people get it. You know, you don't have to stop and debrief and do what we do in a workshop. You know, just a, it's like a perspective or a, a layer you can add into an asana class. And a workshop is more like, right, just this, you know, with the breaks and the talking and the rest of it. Thanks. Uh, Again, you, you keep answering kind of the question. I'm not <laughs> you have, I guess, a good intuitive mind. But uh, I'm still, just to dive a bit deeper, uh, in the first part of the conversation, you mentioned developing your own style and your own direction. So I presume you're, you were talking about this kind of method? Yeah, yeah. So um, I got together with a bunch of senior yoga teachers and said, okay, let's do something different with a different aim. And we took a few years to work it out and we tested different poses and we had to make sure they were like cross-culturally apparent by doing, you know, did workshop in Lithuania, for example, you know, did workshops in different places and so oh, do Russians use self-care in the same way. And, you know, they have a self-care pose that makes everyone cry in Russia. And, you know, we looked at this cross-culture. I looked at it with teachers. We took, make sure they were safe physically. And boy, did I get some stick, you know, like British people do not like innovators, you know, like a lot of people like, <laughs> who the hell do you think you are with only 20 years of experience and massive embodiment experiences? You know, it was like, people really didn't like it, you know, that I was innovating. Um, but then people saw it and they were like, you know what, this makes sense, this works, you know. The biggest issue we have with it is it's too emotionally impactful. So it works almost mm -hmm. too well. It just really is quite um, full on as an experience to do it if you go full into it. Um, as I said, you can do light versions, but... Um, yeah, now there's teachers teaching all over the world and they're doing it in different ways. Like, you know, one of my students does it like women's empowerment. Another one uh, does it with business people. Another one does it with climbers. You know, another one does it with um, ex sex trafficked women in the Spanish islands. You know, she does it for their healing and trauma. So it's, there's loads of applications that are really varied because it's, um, it's a principles based system rather than a dogma based system. Yeah, nice. Uh, while we still have time, I want to dive a bit uh, back to the dark side of yoga, but kind of a connection <laughs> point. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say a few more words about that uh, in a moment, but uh, kind of to make a bridge between your personal experience and the dark side of yoga. Uh, when you're doing these workshops, you mentioned some resistance, uh, but there's one more thing, like a quick story. A friend of mine yeah. was going to a uh, breathing workshop, like with some top expert okay. in the world. I can't remember who, who it is, but well known. And he mentioned, and he's a BJJ guy, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but uh, so yoga world is not really familiar to him, but he noticed that the yogis who are in that breathing workshop, and he was kind of surprised in, uh, by commenting about it. He was like, they seem like they were resist resisting to, towards uh, the whole exactly. approach to the, like a scientific approach. Like, and, he, and he was saying specifically, like, it seems like there was some ego involved in it. And he was surprised. <laughs> but to me, you know, when I heard about it, I was like, it reminds me of yoga and, and you know, that kind of um, 
quick quick point again. Uh, there's the a book I can't remember which book, but the author was exploring the dark side of, of yoga. He called yoga instructors um, kind of pirate ships with white flags. You know, they're they're. Okay. Oh wow! Uh, I particularly see this in yoga men, low integrity spineless motherfuckers who are trying to shag your girlfriend when you're not looking like yeah, that's, no, yeah, that's yeah. pirate shit with the white flag that's what i see in the yoga world and that's not all yoga men but that's definitely in the in the in the tradition i mean it's, it's men who have failed at being men by the normal standards so they're looking for a way to be better than other men right mm. so it's like i can't be more macho i can't be more dominant or more rich or more you know the sort of traditional cultural values which they don't ascribe to but they are there and then you know okay well what am i going to do okay well i can still be spiritually superior if i use a funny voice and dress specially and call myself a special name um so i think it's, everyone's looking for that edge to be superior whether they admit it or not and this is no everyone's gonna say well, oh my god mark you're a monster you know not everybody thinks like you you have to realize you're a fucking monster you know like real when you look at footage of concentration camps or gulags um or atrocities that have been committed that's you okay that's who you are you're part of that humanity on both sides of it so to acknowledge that we do have urge for power dark sides think about what yoga is as a yoga teacher you spend 90 minutes telling people exactly what to do how to sit, how to stand. How, Rockus, you're breathing wrong. Stop smiling, put your head on straight. Like what could be more dictatorial than that? What could be more of a power trip to a largely unsuccessful person who's never managed a company, maybe never looked after kids, maybe never um, been in charge of people in some way. And all of a sudden this 25 year old is now dictating how to be, everyone how to breathe. And now imagine they realize they can go on Instagram and they can have a thousand people or 10,000 people, a hundred thousand people looking at them saying they look amazing and they're spiritual. Like power corrupts. Who would not be seduced by that? So any yoga teacher that says they're in no way dictatorial and they don't understand that urge for power is a liar. And I think it gets pushed down. Like there's certain emotions that aren't allowed in the yoga world, like anger. So what you see is this like nice spiritual, everything's love and light. And then just underneath that, they want to fucking kill you. Cause it's just, <laughs> under the or sex gets pushed down and it leads to all these sex scandals and sleazy guys and what have you, you know? So anything that's repressed is coming out sideways rather than saying, you know what? I'm a guy and part of me wants to be in control of the world. And part of me is kind of horny and part of me is kind of a control freak. Personally, I think Aikido is worse for arrogance though mm. spiritual arrogance is very interesting because it's not evidence-based. So you're a mixed martial artist. If you say you're good at jujitsu, mm. someone could be like, well, let's see, let's put it to the yeah. test. Let's the brutal confrontation with reality. You know, let's see how good you are at jujitsu, you know, whereas in Aikido, you don't really have that. And in yoga, you definitely don't have that. Like, how would I prove to you that I'm more enlightened than you? I'm more spiritual than you. Like maybe cause I'm more vegan than you or some shit. Right. I, you know, I have a, you know, I can do a better back bend, so I'm more spiritual than you, right? People are looking for these external um, justifications and the, the, the correlation with the physical flexibility with the spiritual attainment is the big mistake, obviously. You know, or else Chinese gymnasts would be the most spiritual people, right? Like eight-year-old Chinese gymnasts would be the most enlightened. Um, so that's clearly a mistake, yeah, it's still in the yoga world. Somehow this is an advanced posture. Um, and that's seductive and we're human beings and we're prone to the corruption of power. It's, it's like you put someone in, you know, there's a revolution and then the revolutionaries take over, they become the next dictators. You know, this is just human nature. So mm -hmm. I'd say the, the lack of confrontation with reality, the lack of feedback from reality that let's say MMA would have, um, combined with this very vague sense of what does it mean to be spiritual? What, how do I know who's more spiritual, me or you? I mean, that's a really fun game. Do you want to play the game? It's a really good game. Here's how the game works. I say I'm more spiritual than you for a reason. And you say, no, 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 I'm more spiritual for this reason. So I'm <laughs> more like spiritual than you. I meditated this morning, so I'm more spiritual than you. Your turn. Oh, crap. Uh, I'm not spiritual, I guess. No, but I see your point, 100%. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 a, no, it's a really fun game to play. And if people refuse to play the game, that's just part of the game. That's called the humility move. Or the I'm so spiritual, I won't play the game move. So you can actually... <laughs> completely non-consensually play this with yogis at yoga festivals and they, they hate it. So nobody knows what spirituality is, 
right? Like Ken Wilber gives nine definitions. So how do you compare it, right? So all you're left with is the externals, like I wear white and I'm vegan and I'm really flexible, and the bullshit. That's all you're left with. So it's, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's no wonder that power corrupts because it's, and everyone's very insecure as well because no one knows exactly what defines excellence. Does it make mm. sense? That there is, like, I see in the jiu-jitsu world, I don't see that insecurity. Yeah? So it's, it's the, yeah. the ego is this inflated structure with this very insecure core in Aikido and yoga. Yeah. 100%. Uh, one thing I'm reflecting about what you're saying is you, you mentioned that kind of recognizing the, the monster side of it. And I almost start to not, not taking that as an abusive side and kind of giving yourself an off the hook for, for saying, Oh, actually I'm a monster. So I'm going to go do fuck. But that but doesn't just, mean that it's actually, I'm a monster. So therefore I'm going to be careful. Yeah, right, exactly. ethical. right. There's, there's one of the directions which I'm inspired about, which is similar is again, looking Aikido is a great example for that because it's all about peace. But, and I think it would apply to yoga, but in regards to martial arts, if you're saying that you're a peacemaker, but you don't know war, you don't know how to you know, kill a person, per se, uh, then you're not, a peace, you're not a peacemaker. You're just kind of being a nice guy because you don't want to get punched in the face. Only if you're capable of destroying someone and you choose not to, then you're, you know, then you're kind and then you're a good person. So I think, would you say that applies to yoga as well, kind of admitting that inside we're all a bit dicks? But then I'm just, I'm fine with that. Potential. We have the potential to be selfish, violent, abusive, control for, you know, all that. The line of good and evil runs down the human heart, right? So to not acknowledge you have that in you will lead to unpleasantness because it will come out in weird ways. And to acknowledge that gives you a chance to go, you know what? I can be really greedy. So, you know, what? I have to be careful that I'm not trying to rip off my students. Because it, it just sneaks in a little bit, you know, they the key thing, and this is the key, the heart of Western civilization, which is amazing, and I don't know why people keep abusing it, is the commitment to truth. So it's like, and this is what you've had in your martial arts journey that's so admirable, and is just, you know what, what matters most to me is the truth. Even if that is an ego bash to me, upsets mm -hmm. my relationships, my dojo, my students, if I have to you know, leave my wife, you know, whatever it is. But that commitment to truth that's so admirable in your martial arts journey that people have followed and now continues in your more kind of psychological kind of other work, you know, that is the heart of Western civilization. And that is not the case in many, for many people in many places because most people are committed to what is easy, what is uh, convenient, uh, what maintains their social relationships, you know, it, it takes more than courage. I mean, you have to be a little bit crazy to go, you know what, I could say what I know isn't true and I can easily lie. And you know, yes, that scrapes 1% off my soul, but you know what, my friends are still going to love me and I, I'm still going to be, you know, welcome at work. And this ability to speak truth, and I found this in the yoga world before it was <laughs> acceptable, I didn't do it very skillfully. And, you know, that is absolutely the heart, I think, of, of, of a very small group of people who are willing to bash their own ego and upset people. Mm. And, you know, you always look at what a person's willing to deal with. If, is it something like weightlifting or jiu-jitsu where there's feedback or running a business? Like the market doesn't give a shit about your ego. Like the market's just like, we'll buy your product if it's any good. If it's not, we won't. Bad luck. You know, so that is someone willing to keep putting themselves out there in that way, even though it's brutal and you lose your friends, you know, and it's like, and then you get a new lot of friends, right? And they're better friends because they're more aligned with your actual values and what you actually think is true. But then you evolve and you lose those friends, right? It's like, damn. So it's, um, I'm not even recommending it to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think for us, it's, it's almost evident, but to make sure that the audience is included, uh, I'll, I'll pose it as a question. So the yoga world, you mentioned that soft-spoken voice and the way you carry yourself and the words you say and the words you don't say, all of that, it's almost imposed. It's almost like suggested to do that. Would you yeah. say that that's part of the problem of why people deny the, the sure. real side of themselves? Mm. So any art has a culture. Like Aikido has a culture. MMA has a culture. When learning an art, you accidentally learn the culture. 
Mm. You can't help it. It's like a kid growing up in Lithuania starts to speak your weird ass beautiful language. You just can't help it. You're just in that soup, right? It's like, I love Lithuania, but it's a great language. The fuck is it weird? And like, you just can't help it. You just learn it. So it's the same with the culture. You start going to Aikido, you get enculturated. Nobody tells you, but you just learn. This is how we do things around here. And maybe certain emotions are, well, you probably don't want to express that because you won't, you know, you come in one day at yoga, so I'm so pissed off and your friends just distanced. And it's body language and it's subtle. It's, you know, and little nudge by nudge, you're getting nudged into a culture um, through that conditioning process. And if that culture gives you a set of benefits, like you get to feel spiritually superior, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's quite a payoff psychologically, or you get to distance yourself. You say, oh, you know what? I'm poor and I'm unsuccessful with women. And you know what? I'm not, you know, I'm not really physically very well, but you know what? At least I'm better than everyone. Cause I'm <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like what a payoff who wouldn't be like, what? A, it's like you trade reality for that illusion. Right. Mm -hmm. And you see this with the keyboard warriors. You see this with the, you know, so many times people trade, an actual benefit for an illusionary one. So I think it's mm -hmm. that, and that is almost unavoidable. And if it wasn't the spiritual breathy voice, it would be something else. Like the macho culture is also a way of repressing, but it represses fear, not anger, right? Like if you're in a, in a martial arts dojo and you're not allowed to be afraid because everyone's macho, you're repressing something. So you're putting on a persona, you're getting further away from your emotional reality. So yeah. I think we've got two, re I'm sort of thinking out loud here, but there's two realities <laughs> that people distance from one is inner and emotional and one is external like reality. But here's the mm. thing. Reality always kicks you in the ass. And this is what we saw with COVID, right? People have built their fantasy worlds, but it's like, okay, how's your reality here? Like, like reality bites you on the ass sooner or later. And that bite on the ass might be cancer. It might be a wife leaving you. It might be having no money and not paying a rent. Like reality always wins. So it's like, it's like, it's like, when do you want your ass kicked now or later, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, really that's the only choice I think we have with reality. And, um, in the post they said, well, who's reality and what reality? And this is my own truth. Shut the fuck up. Like, like if you're starving, you want bread, not postmodernism. So it's, um, <laughs> you know, this is what martial artists know. They're like, you don't argue about the relativity of a kick to the face. It's just reality. <laughs> Yeah. Well, because that dark side of the world is all over the place, what would you say is the cure for that? Like, what would you recommend for, let's say, someone is waking up to the truth and, and they're trying to, to be <laughs> Yeah, right, exactly. And so what, what would you say, like, do this, do that, or whatever? Don't be an asshole like me. That's not necessary. You can be nice like rockers. Um, okay. <laughs> So I think what you did is very wise, which is cross training because, because every art has its own culture and its own bullshit by cross training, you'll see through the bullshit. It's like traveling, you know, you're in Lithuania, you live there. It's great. Right. But then you go live abroad and you're like, Oh, maybe that weird Lithuanian thing we do isn't so cool because in Ireland, they don't do that. Right. Like you learn to, this is the journey away from home. That's the first journey. Um, and then there's the journey back to home, like which you've literally done in your case. Right. And you come back home and you go, okay, now I'm going to recommit to being at home in yoga or whatever it is, but with these fresh eyes, uh, the other one I would say is, is, is do something that has that brutal confrontation with reality because it just changes your worldview um, and get some therapy. Like the big thing that's missing from the Eastern traditions is therapy. So therapy and mindfulness are mutually, um, they're not, they can be combined, but they're not the same thing. And mm. no matter how much mindfulness you do, you won't see your shadow. Because mm. right, it's unconscious by definition and mindfulness is about consciousness. Now, you know, you could argue if you meditate for long enough, eventually the shadow comes up and that's kind of true. But the, the, the therapy is a Western tradition. Trauma therapy is a Western tradition. Mm. The East is mindfulness. So it's not, no one has the whole picture. And I'm mm -hmm. not belittling the East. It's a great tradition they've given us through, you know, Aikido and yoga and all these things. But the West's given us trauma therapy and Jungian psychotherapy and all the rest of it. Do mm. some therapy. That's the other side. And, and, and the third thing I'd say is who do you surround yourself with? Like, mm -hmm. I know if I go, let's say me and you go to a yoga club, right? Or me and you go to check out a new market. You're visiting London. I say, hey, come on, let's fucking go check this out. You know, this is a good class. Let's go do this. We go on a, bro a romantic date to a class together. Afterwards, we're going to tell the truth to each other. We're going to say, you know what, Mark? I think this guy's full of shit. You know what, Mark? I know you, you look good there, but it's not real, the real deal. So I think having people around you who uh, um, tell you things you don't like, and are rude enough to do that is really important. 
like if everyone around you is saying, and I've seen this a lot with guru types, like I interview for the embodiment conference, I'm in touch with nearly 1000 teachers. Mm -hmm. Boy, do some of them have some ego. Boy, do they have ego. <laughs> they all think they're bigger than they are. And there's some great teachers, some really cool ones that I count as friends and I'm very lucky. And there's a good percentage that are really, I want to email like a couple of them have said, you know, I should be a headliner because I'm so famous. I'm like, I've barely heard of you. Who the hell do you think <laughs> you are? Like what, like get over yourself, dude. Like, and they're clearly surrounded by only their students who are kissing their ass. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm lucky. I have a wife who kind of like, I come back from training and I'm all inflated and I'm like, yeah, I've been the king of the embodiment facilitator course for a week. And she's like, do the washing up and shut up. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's like I've got a sister who doesn't care what mindfulness is and always thinks Aikido is called Taekwondo. You know, like that's, that is healthy shit. So if you, the family is great for this, you know, and this is what you have when you return home. So the journey is separation and return. So you've had this literally just separation, this hero's journey, where you separate from Aikido, but also left home, you left your dojo, right? Yeah. And the, the return is actually the hard bit. And the return is when you get disillusioned a second time, because you get disillusioned with the solution to the disillusion. And some of the stuff you've learned just doesn't really fly back home. And you have to deal with your family again, it's way more intense than dealing with people kicking you in the head in dojos in Ireland, you know? Like, mm. like, I don't need to tell you this, right? Like, what's been your experience of that return? Because that, that to me is the really tricky bit. Like, people deny Western culture and become pseudo Indian, and then do they return back to Western culture, right? Assuming that yeah. you know they are from the West. So, what's what's been your experience of the return? If I can turn the interview around on you, because that's that's interesting. Yeah, to me. yeah sure. Uh, I'd have to actually think about it. Uh, it's not that something I think about a lot. It just kind of happened to me through through the process. Uh, I think part of me feels a bit resentful towards some of the stuff like I would have, I, I mentioned that in one of my videos, like I went accidentally a few months ago into like a spiritual seminar uh -huh. workshop, uh -huh. like, you know, you scream and you hit the floor with the towel. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You know, you move, yeah. yeah, like all, all that stuff for like a few hours. And I didn't realize I'm what I'm going to. And then I'm like, oh crap, I recognize it from like the first moment I see the teacher and I see the people <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I've been here. Yeah. No, and, and I kind of said, okay, you know what? I'll just go through it. I'll blend in and I'll just, I'll just live through it and I'll show that I can yeah. do it. Even You're still. a helpful guy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, the, the part of me was like, I hate this. I don't want to do this anymore. And, and somebody, <laughs> or, or somebody tells me, you know, you should reinvent Aikido or do some Aikido. I'm like, I, I can't see myself being a kid anymore. I just can't. Maybe it's going to pass. But, but otherwise, I don't know. It's, I'm again, it's... Right. Sorry, my dog. I'm is hearing a noise there, was that? <laughs> so, That's my dog. Anyway. Dog. He, okay. That's like a child yeah, dying. Yeah. Okay. Let's, he's talking to um, <laughs> They're okay. So, yeah, I mean, I might start like, you know, Dojo one day again, you know? I have to get back into it. But um, that might be a return that I, I'd consider. And the other thing I noticed is I, w I had to go through a stage of hating yoga. And now I can be in like a tantric, esoteric Indian style yoga class. I can quite enjoy it. Like, mm. cause I enjoy it for what it is. And, and when the teacher says, open your third eye chakra or something, I, I know that it's bad instruction and it's unscientific or whatever, and I can still enjoy it now. So there can be part of the return can be, you know, I might not be going back to Aikido for you. It might be something else, but there, there can be this like reintegration process of going, okay, it's not total bullshit the, psychologically we have to push something away to get something new and then the reintegration can happen. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, culturally that's the same thing, right? We have to get away from our culture by traveling or pretending to be an Indian yogi or something, you know, and changing our mm -hmm. name and whatever. And then there's that reintegration process. And I, I think as a society, that's the bit that's needed is not the escaping to Bali or Thailand in this fantasy world. Great as a temporary thing, you know, it's good to get away. But then can you actually come home? And that's the reality that's hitting with COVID as well. It's like, it's like you really want to be stuck on a tropical island with no medical facilities now? Great. You'd rather be at home where you can actually take care of your family. And, you know, it's, it is, there's a, a call, you know, I've had students of mine say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to stay in Sweden this year, you know, wherever they are. You know? mm -hmm. and, and, and even if the travel restrictions are lifted, because they've realized that there's a reality there. There's a gravity, mm -hmm. a smell of bread, a amusing metaphor. So. Yeah, yeah. There's one more thing that came up uh, to me about reflecting about the journey, which actually is interesting. And I didn't think that much about it before you asked me, but uh, I was recording a bunch of videos because I was like super inspired about sharing some of my stories. 
and I was uh, talking about Aikido, kind of the philosophy of Aikido and how I think it fails at delivering it. But then by the end of it, by the end of me reflecting what Aikido is without any relationship to my experience, just like what's the essence of Aikido, I actually felt inspired about it. Part of me was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this sounds good. And, <laughs> and, I, and, you know, I thought, I imagined myself like, what if I would, you know, go, go down the path and whatever, how much hard work it would take, but I would try to really embody that and deliver it in an efficient kind of uh, existing way, like reality-based way. Mm -hmm. That actually felt inspiring. So I, I, I definitely think I'm still on the journey to fully come back home. Yeah, now Aikido 2.0. Where yeah. I mean, here's the thing, an Aikido, an Aikido school which focuses on personal growth, which is what it's good at, and reconnects the art to reality and says, listen, this is just a training tool. You know, we're not really looking. This is realistic. And you know what? This is, you know, you could make it more realistic in some ways. But as you say, I've seen your journey that another valid move is just to say, hey, this is more like a kind of yoga and, you know, no one really attacks like this, but this is, you know, wrist grabs are just an easy way to play and easy way to develop with. So the reality-based, getting the reality-based nature of it. And I, it's an interesting question for me, like how connected to that reality feedback do you need to be mm. for it to keep its roots? Is mm -hmm. it, does it have to be cage fighting? Or mm -hmm. can it be somewhere down the line? You could also look at this from the other angle. What if you started an MMA school where the primary focus was personal growth, mm. right? Now, that would mean you would spend less time doing certain things. So your fighters wouldn't be winning fights that much against yep. equally skilled people, right? Because there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off in what you're doing. So I think you can come at it from either of those two directions. Because I would love mm. to, and I, I definitely see jiu-jitsu schools that have some sense of character development, for example. I went to an MMA school that had zero sense of that at all. Zero, if anything, it was the opposite. And I went to a jiu-jitsu school that had like a pretty good sense of it, but sort of vague and in the background and good-hearted. And yeah, this helps you grow as a person, but not really focusing on that because let's choke each other out, you know? Um, let's spar because it's a competition next week, you know? Um, so I wonder what it would be like to go from that direction as, as well. I think both of those things are possible. You, you could have both in the same school, right? You could have a building that had, you know, I, what I imagine would be, I think it's for different people at different times in their life as well. It's like there's a yoga class, a meditation class, an Aikido class, a Jiu Jitsu class, and an MMA class, all in the same place. And like the young men, I'd be like, go to MMA. Just go punch someone in the face. You're young, go to MMA. And then if someone got too fantasy based in the Aikido class, you could say, ah, come to Jiu Jitsu with me on Tuesday. See how, like, yeah. see how your ego does. And equally, someone's done Jiu Jitsu. Maybe they've done it for 20 years. They're getting old. They're not competing so much. They go, you know what? You might want to come to Aikido. You could. You know, to start doing the Tai Chi class and the Aikido class a little bit. You know what I mean? I, I feel like if there was a community where all those things were held and everybody knew the ecosystem, this is more reality based, but less personal growth. This is in the middle. This is, you know, if there was an eco, and this is really my dream, you know, when I make my first million, this will be what I'll be building, purpose built in the center of London. It's built, I'll just put it out there if there's any millionaires listening. Like that would be an amazing place where all levels could operate all ages all physical abilities because not everyone can do MMA just physically right and, and mm -hmm. personality wise some people just don't want to get hit in the face do you know what I mean? they should at least know what that's like if they're going to do 20 years of Aikido like I know I people have done 20 years of Aikido you know, never been punched in the face oh it's like, yeah. I, mean, I didn't for me it was like 13 but still <laughs> <laughs> it was like really <laughs> but equally could you do like you know you could do 20 years of Jiu Jitsu and never meditate I'm like you're doing an Asian martial art come on you know, right. uh, I'm conscious that we, we have little time left, time. but I wanted to make That's sure right. I have much time left, Ruckus. Time's running out. I'm old. I'm 40. I'm going <laughs> to die soon. Ask me a good question. Yeah, no, no well, pressure, right? <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I have a feeling probably we'll be able to pick up uh, the other subjects uh, in the future, but, but I wanted to bring this one to you. Um, you spoke about Aikido and, and kind of showing a different side of it uh, or blending it in with other practices. I know that you're already doing that, or at least from what I know, uh, using the embodiment side from Aikido. So can you say a few words on how is that working out and how, what's your take on delivering Aikido to other people? Well, I haven't trained Aikido much at all lately. When I do Aikido now, I just pop in because I like the people. I really like the club that I train at. And... Um, I use it as a practice of creativity. 
So yeah. I'm mostly in a sort of playful Takamusi Aiki kind of playful. Imp- I'm very improvisational. And my sensei sort of rolls his eyes and just looks the other way when I'm playing around with it. And occasionally I'll throw in a jiu-jitsu choke or a karate kick or something else in there just, to, just for fun. But really, it's for me, it's a practice of joy and play. And I, I think other than sex, there's very few things I do that are as much fun as how I do Aikido now when I do make it to the dojo, which is not convenient and you know various other reasons why I don't go so much. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. In terms of combining it, um, you bring it, I'd say bringing in the life skills. So as I've done with yoga, you could easily do it Aikido. And in fact, the embodied yoga principles, I basically worked out first in Aikido. And then I went, nobody bloody does Aikido. Let's do it in yoga instead. Yeah. Um, so the principles of learning basic skills, like the centering, you know, the centering is a big one. Um, that's just a life skill. And then bringing it into the verbal domain, the verbal Aikido. There's, there's people who do this, like um, Quinton Cook in the UK does this. There's various people that do this. Um, Strozzi does a little bit of this in, in America, which is Strozzi Heckler. So you can bring in, yeah, he, re- he reads poetry in the middle of an Aikido class. You know, the first time I was in his class and that happened, I was like, what's going on, California, you know? But it's great what he does. It's really good. It's really good. And he brings in leadership work. So you can definitely use Aikido as a sort of leadership dojo, a personal growth dojo. Often what happens is the techniques degrade though, you know, because it's just, especially if you're training just two, two classes a week, like, that's not very much. Like most people are hobbyists in, you know, in the UK, America, they seem to train a bit more France, sometimes mm. a bit more, but if you're training two nights a week, which if you're married and you've got kids and a business like I have, whatever, it's pretty tricky to train much more than that. Maybe three, right? Three is like your wife's complaining, you know, four, you're getting a divorce. So it's, you know, there's this general, generally you, there's a minimum amount of, there's a practice there that you can, you know, minimize. You can, I can do my meditation in the morning before she wakes up. So it's no, no conflict, but it's, um, yeah, like how much can you be, I'm thinking out loud here, the technical excellence and the personal growth excellence, does that require, like in my fantasy dojo, you know, does that require a commitment of a bit more than most people have? And I think it's different for professionals like, you know, an embodiment professional like me. I mean, I'm doing 10, 15 hours a week practice because it's my job, right? Yeah. Like my, like today I did a breath work session in the morning, you know, I'll be doing a yoga class tonight. I'll be doing a Sistema class tomorrow. Sistema is quite a nice mix, actually, of sort of fantasy and reality, like in terms of the, that line. You know, it's, it's got some crazy fantasy stuff in it, but most actual dojo clubs of Sistema are on that line. And they're a little bit closer than Aikido, I think, you know, um, and it's got the creativity, which I really enjoy. So, yeah, I don't know. There's my ramblings on that. I hope some of that was useful. I'm, I, sure. I'm not by just saying I actually like yoga. Like, I'm a natural critic just because that's my... I'm, cantankerous you know disagreeable asshole but i actually really like yoga and it's mm. it's it's if someone said to me i'm doing a yoga class i would smile i wouldn't mm. think oh my god they're being abused and oh, it's a cult my first reaction would be like if my sister said hey mark i got a bit stressed so i thought i'd do yoga i was a bit weird but i heard about it on the tv and now i'm doing a yoga class at my local sports center i would be happy you know so i think a bit of a danger when we start to see these hidden dark sides is to forget that yoga and aikido like i'm happy if anyone's doing that shit you know like that's because their life will probably be better than if they don't even if there's traps on the path so i think that's sort of i kind of want to end there rather than just be like the guy who's like on the internet bad mouthing everyone i think it's also good to be a little positive sometimes right actually that's that's what i that's the last question i wanted to ask uh, unless like it's are we like no no, no we're good we're good we've got five so thanks. I'll just wrap up with the question. Uh, the so the yoga that's that's what I noticed as well. Like I made the video uh, why yoga sucks, and I said it somewhere in the middle of it. Like actually, there's yoga is good, but and then a lot of people didn't hear that part. They're like they thought I'm. Oh, you're gonna get hey, You're kicking their puppy. You have to understand that someone yoga saved their life. It's turned their life around. It gave them hope after they got a divorce. It got them fit. It, it stopped them from killing themselves. And then you come along kicking their puppy with your fucking clickbait title rockers. It doesn't matter that you said in the middle of the video. <laughs> I get it, man. I get it. I get it. Like that, You're just going to get that shit. But that shows the fundamentalism. If people, it's mm-hmm. like, if you want to know if someone's fundamentalist about their religion, critique it, right? Mm-hmm. It's the same with yoga. So if someone says, hey, you're a Christian, do you really think the Virgin Mary was a virgin? Come on. You know, hey, you're a Muslim. Do you really think this? Really? And if they're like, you know what? Yeah, I get it. You know, fair enough. Okay, great. We'll have a conversation about it. They've got their yeah. faith. I've got mine. But if they like immediately get defensive of any criticism, 
or walk away because there's no you can't have a conversation with fundamentalists there's no conversation because there's no listening because they're already right so why bother? You found this with the Aikido. I see you like patiently replying to all these assholes in the Aikido <laughs> world. And you'd be like, well, actually, and here's my logical point of view. I'd be like, Rocco, shut the fuck up. They're not listening. <laughs> they can't yeah. listen. You're wasting your time. Only dialogue with people who are capable of dialoguing. Don't cast your fucking pearls to swine. So, you know, that's what I would say when you see those comments. It's thank you for your feedback, delete. Thank you for your feedback, block. Thank you for your feedback, delete. And the people that challenge you in a logical way and can have a conversation, they're the ones you to put your time into, right? Yeah, sure. Well, be, since we have those last few minutes, so we can both agree that yoga can be a great practice, but there's a lot of shit to work through, right? You've got to be careful kind of with all practices. Great, great. And uh, last, last thing to make sure people would know where to find you and uh, maybe your book or the conference and everything like that. If they're a yogi, they should check out Embodied Yoga Principles. Just Google that on YouTube on the website. You can see that. We have an online training uh, at the moment. Um, if they're just interested in embodiment, they can look up the Embodiment Conference, the Embodiment Conference. We do lots of free events. There's lots of free stuff on the website as well. Um, if they're coaches or trainers, facilitators, they should look up the Embodied Facilitator course. And if they can read, if they can read at all, they should get Embodiment, moving beyond mindfulness um so i don't know how many of your audience fit in those categories and you can add me on facebook if you do that kind of shit and instagram there's a good picture of me in a bikini doing yoga poses on instagram so um that's hot mark walsh look it up baby so, you know what what's funny that instagram picture of me in my wife's bikini on bar in bali when we we're on holiday you're not doing okay. yoga holiday, got more likes than all my other instagram pictures even me pretending to be an Instagram girl got more hit, got more likes. My wife says, <laughs> it's like, really. "Okay, it was, Rock, this is a pleasure, man. If you ever want to chat again, I'm always. I like talking with you, man. I felt today I just ran here a bit, but uh, if you want to chat no, again, it's a pleasure." I think we we did some good brainstorming as well, and it wasn't all clear thoughts from the past. But I always enjoy when there's a sense of you know looking at something at the moment. So it was a right great an edge, right? A bit of like, "What is that?" Thinking yeah, exactly. out loud. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've got to go with you the for a day today. So again. Yeah. Thank you very much. Till next time. Pleasure, man. Thank you. Take care. Love to Lithuania.